Uh, greetings of the day, everyone. I, Riddhi Vasu, is privileged to welcome you all into the first student's edition of Orange City Literature Festival, organized by Asia Knowledge Foundation in association with J.H. Rison University, powered by Risoni Group of Institutions. The motive behind the fest is to explore the ways that should help students develop emotional intelligence exposing children to quality literature can contribute to the creation of responsible, successful, and caring individuals. Plunge into the Garbodaga Ocean where it all started and immerse yourself into the stories of some of the most exotic, magical, and powerful asuras and rakshasas in the human mythology. Demons and demonesses of Hindu mythology takes you millions of years back in time when it did Begin, be, when beings as tall as mountains walk the ground, their every stride cause earthquakes and tsunamis when they stayed in their mother's wombs for thousands of years before being born, when they transformed into lions or buffaloes or elephants in the blink of an eye, and when encountering beings with five heads, three legs, twenty arms, or indeed torsos without head was not an exception, but the norm. So to explore this majestical side of the Hindu mythology, we have the speaker for the art who shall be talking on the topic of Let's Talk About Demons and Demonesses of Hindu Mythology by Priya Narayanan. Before that, we uh, let me please introduce our speaker for the art. Priya Narayanan Ma'am is an interior designer, design educator and an award-winning children's author based in Ahmedabad. Amongst the books she has written for children are the Need Book Award winning Sri Navasa Ramanujan, Friend of Numbers with Silica Book, and Ten Heads of Tanuj with Harper Collins India that won Speaker Book Children's Choice Award. Her most recent book is The Demons and Demonesses of Hindu Mythology with Rupa Publications that takes her young readers time traveling into the world of some of the most fascinating Asuras and Rakshasas. When not practicing and designing, Ma'am likes to travel solo and read everything that comes her way. The readers and the viewers can also know more about Ma'am on her website that is www.priyanarayanan.in. So, without further ado, I'll hand over the session to you, Ma'am, for your talk. Thank you, Riti, for the introduction. Uh, and hi, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to all of you here at the debut edition of the Orange City Lit Fest for Children. Uh, although we are doing this online this time, I hope I'll be able to keep it engaging enough for all of you to stick on till the end. And I don't plan to stretch it on and on. Um, also, I hope that uh, amongst my audience, I have uh, parents and grandparents, uh, you know, along with the children, because what I'm going to talk about today is going to be interesting for all age groups. Uh, so, as Riddhi just mentioned, I'm going to be talking about all those um, sometimes magical and exotic or sometimes perceived as uh, big, bad and evil demons and demonesses in Hindu mythology, whom we call Asuras, Asuris, Rakshasas and Rakshasis, because uh, that's what my book is all about. And uh, in this book, uh, to begin with, I have answered a lot of questions about uh, demons and demonesses because I'm sure all of you will be wondering who are these, uh, you know, big, bad, evil uh, beings and where did they come from? So I start with their origin stories, how they came into this world, how they were born into this world, uh, where they live. Uh, for example, uh, we have Indra, you know, all the devas living in Swarga Loka and the, uh, it is so splendorous uh, and beautiful there and the Asuras also wanted a similar place. So they asked Maya Sura to build them a Swarga in Patala and that is called the Bila Swarga. So that is something I'm describing in detail in this book. Uh, then we're talking about what are the differences between Rakshasas and Asuras. Uh, I'm also talking about the origin or the meaning of the words. For example, what is the amazing meaning of the word Asura and how did that meaning change over the years? Uh, for example, at the beginning when the Rishis started writing the Rig Veda, uh, the meaning of Asura was any being who was super smart, super intelligent and super powerful. And um, so if you see in the earlier shlokas, you will find Indra, uh, Vayu, uh, Surya, Rudra, all of them being referred to as Asuras. 
uh, it's only later on when they were writing the Rig Veda towards the end of it that the Rishis felt there was a need to separate uh, the Asuras who used their super intelligence and power for doing good deeds versus doing bad deeds. And so the those of them who did the good deeds were, uh, you know, given the name Devas and those who were using it for not so good deeds remained Asuras. So that's something you will again get to read in the book. And of course, the most important part of the book is uh, the part where I narrate the uh, fascinating stories of 17 of these demons and demonesses. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is read a little bit from the very first story in the book. And for this, I want you all to close your eyes uh, for some time uh, till I ask you to open your eyes, right? And just try and visualize uh, the portion that I'm going to be reading out. So here goes. Uh, long before the world was created, when there was no heaven, no earth, no day, no night, the universe was only a vast ocean. In the middle of this ocean, Narayana, the one who rests on the waters of creation, rested in a deep meditative state, on the coils of Adishesha, the great snake. As nothing had yet been created, there was nothing to preserve or look after. So Narayana remained in the strands for thousands and thousands of years. Until suddenly one day, a lotus sprung out from his navel and bloomed. Inside this uh, lotus was Brahma reciting the Vedas. But with goddess Adya Shakti residing within him in the form of Yoga Nitra, uh, Narayana slept on and on oblivious to even this uh, springing out of the lotus and the birth of Brahma. Once two specks of ear wax fell off his ears and into the sea, and out of these specks emerged two beings. Who are we? Where are we? Where did we come from? How did we come here? They wondered as they swam into the deep waters of the ocean. Then, noticing far above them something, they swam upwards. Who is this giant, they wondered, as they looked at Adishesha. As they searched for answers to their questions, Goddess Adi Shakti appeared before them. I know you have many questions, and I will answer them for you, she said. Then, conferring the names Madhu and Kaitaba on them, she taught them the mantra that explained the origin of the universe. And then she disappeared. Well, you can open your eyes now. As you have guessed, this story is about Madhu and Kaitaba. Were you able to imagine the deepness and the darkness of the Karpotaka ocean? Because that is the ocean in which Vishnu was resting, Narayana was resting in fact. And that is the ocean in which Madhu and Kaitaba were born into. And the most interesting thing is it is called the Garbhodaka because Garba means womb. And it is in the mother's womb that all creation starts and takes place. And that is why the whole ocean is the Garbhodaka ocean where the entire life in this universe emerges. Even Brahma, who later on gives life to other creatures. So I found this very fascinating while doing my research for this book. Also uh, interesting was that when you must have noticed that Madhu and Kaitapa, when they were born, they were just two human beings or Whatever beings we call them, right? Uh, uh, they were not human, of course. So when did this transformation of them uh, uh, being asuras or demons start, right? And um, why are we including them in this book of demons and demonesses? So for this, I think I will take you through their story, the entire story, so that you can see how that transformation actually happens. So getting back to the story, um, once uh, Adi Shakti gave them this mantra, uh, they didn't have anything else to do. So they just sat, closed their eyes and kept on chanting the mantra for thousands and thousands of years. Adi Shakti was impressed with their devotion. And so she came back and she said, Madhu and Kaitaba, I will grant you a boon because I'm really impressed with your devotion. Uh, of course, any human being or any being for that matter that takes birth in this universe, uh, has to die, right? So I cannot give you the boon of immortality, but I will give you the boon to choose how and where you will die. 
and then she disappeared. Now Madhu and Kaitaba were perplexed. They looked at each other and said, um, why would I choose to die at all, right? If I don't choose to die at all, if I don't choose to die, that means I'm immortal. So uh, they thought they found a loophole in Adeshati's boon and uh, they were very happy and they became arrogant. And uh, they, of course, uh, went all around the ocean. They discovered every nook and cranny of the ocean. And then they came back to where Narayana was resting. And there they saw uh, Brahma and a really brilliant light emanating from his hands. So they climbed up the lotus stalk and peeped into uh, you know, Brahma's hands. And there they saw that this brilliant light was being emanated from the Vedas, right? Uh, but they didn't know what the Vedas were actually for. So, I really don't know what this is, but it looks like something precious. So why don't we just steal it and, you know, take it away? So that's what they did. They took the Vedas from Brahma's hands and they jumped back into the ocean and hid in the deep recesses. Uh, so now I think you uh, might have just noticed how there was arrogance first and then there was a little bit of curiosity and now greed, uh, the need to possess something they didn't even know why, uh, you know, what the purpose of that particular thing was. Um, and then Brahma, of course, opened his eyes. He missed the Vedas. He plunged into the ocean to look for them. And when he met Madhu and Kaitaba, they attacked him, they scared him away. So they, he, uh, Brahma went back and prayed to Adya Shakti. And Adya Shakti said, okay, I will withdraw the power of Yoga Nidra from Narayana so that he wakes up and he goes and fights with Madhu Kaitaba to get back to Vedas. Uh, so that's what happened. And when Narayana opened his eyes, uh, he adopted the name Vishnu. Vishnu means he who pervades the entire universe. He adopted the name Vishnu uh, and started fighting with uh, Madhu Kaitapa because obviously they would not, you know, just hand over the Vedas to him just like that. Uh, and he fought with them for thousands and thousands of years, but he was just not able to defeat them. Again, he was perplexed. Uh, he was wondering why. And that's when again Adya Shakti makes her appearance and she says that Vishnu, uh, both Madhu and Kaitapa have born. Uh, have been born from you. They are a part of you. And so they have the exact same physical strength that you have. So you can never defeat them in a physical battle, right? So you will have to use uh, uh, some bit of trickery, some bit of, uh, you know, uh, uh, mental kind of, you know, uh, warfare. And that's how you're going to be able to defeat them. Also, you will have to get them to tell you how and where they want to die. And only then you will be able to kill them. So Vishnu goes back, uh, he pretends to lay down his arms. He says, oh, Madhu and Kaitaba, you're such supreme beings. Uh, you have, uh, I've just not been able to defeat you. So definitely you're more powerful than I am. So um, I bow down to thee. Uh, at the same time, uh, I am the most supreme powerful being in the universe. And because of that, I am going to grant you both a boon. So ask whatever you want and I'll give it to you. So this is where uh, Vishnu tickles the ego of uh, Madhu and Kaitaba, and immediately, you know, they react. They said, "We just defeated you. You just said that, you know, we've defeated you. Then how can you be the most supreme being in the universe? We are the supreme beings, and so you should not be giving us the boon. It should be the other way around. So we are going to give you a boon. Tell us what you want." And of course, Vishnu was very smart. He said. Uh, okay, then give me the boon that I can kill you, right? So both Madhu and Kaitaba were obviously flummoxed. They got to know why uh, God Sadeh Shakti had said that any being that is born into this universe has to die, right? Some way or the other, life catches up with you, death catches up with you. So uh, of course, then they uh, create this impossible, or, or at least what they thought of, you know, impossible scenario. They looked all around them, and saw only water. So they said, uh, if you can find a dry land uh, in this entire watery universe of ours, you can take us there and kill us. So again, they thought that they had actually found a loophole, but no, uh, they were dealing with Vishnu, right? So Vishnu immediately expanded his body to tens and thousands of times of you know the, his, the size that he was at that time. Uh, so much so that his thigh 
uh, pierced the waters of the universe and uh, you know came out and formed a dry island of sorts. And then he picked up Madhu and Kaitaba, placed them on his dry thigh and sliced off their heads. Uh, when he sliced off their heads, their fat, the body fat, which is called Medas in Sanskrit, it trickled down onto the surface of the, uh, of the waters and uh, created a lump. And it is said that this lump is what formed Earth. And that is why other than uh, Bhumi, uh, the Earth has the name Medini uh, given to it, right? So Medas uh, giving birth to Medini. So this was a very fascinating story, which um, I was uh, really, uh, you know, fascinated by when I read it. And uh, that's why, I, and these were the first uh, two Asuric beings, uh, you know, in the entire universe. So you would have noticed that transformation. So there was arrogance, there was greed, there was conceitment, and then, of course, uh, ego that came into play. And all these mixed together were what made them Asuras. Otherwise, they were just two beings, right? Uh, also, uh, the sages who uh, kind of have interpreted the story of Madhu and Kaitaba have uh, looked at it uh, from a different perspective also. For example, they have said that Madhu represents sweet um, praises, right? Some people, Jomaska uh, lagate hai, to kind of, you know, jhaad pe chadate hai or something like that, where they sing praises of you just to get some work uh, done from you, right? And that praise kind of gets into your head and you start getting very proud of yourself, you, you know, ego develops. At the same time, you have uh, Kaitaba, which is supposed to represent uh, sour criticism. So when somebody unnecessarily criticizes you or criticizes you too much, again, you feel uh, really um, angry, frustrated, even depressed. And both these, uh, you know, praises and criticisms, when they enter you, uh, your mind, they enter through your ears, which is the significance of how you know, uh, Madhu and Kaitaba were born from the years of uh, Narayana. They enter your mind and they mess with your intellect, right? They either make you feel very proud and then you end up doing really, uh, you know, stupid things or they make you feel very depressed or angry, again, leading to not so nice consequences. And this intellect is represented by Brahma in the story. So that is something I found it very interesting how the sages have interpreted it and they are trying to tell you, uh, you know, tell the people how to live, uh, uh, you know, good life without, uh, you know, moralizing just through such a lovely story, you can send across so many lovely messages. So uh, this is one of the stories, of course, as um, Ruthi talked about uh, in the beginning when she was introducing the book. Uh, there are a lot of other asuras, uh, other stories that I have included in this book, where here Madhu and Kaitaba were born from the year wax uh, of Vishnu. There is another story in which an asura is born from the sweat of Vishnu, as <laughs> gross as, as it may sound. And there is another one who is born from the anger of Shiva. Right. So a lot of asuras were actually born from gods themselves, which was again another interesting aspect I got to discover. Uh, Okay, great. So now I have gone, I have talked a lot uh, about uh, Asuras now. And um, what I want you to do is now again, uh, do another exercise, right? Uh, you close your eyes in the beginning. Now I want all of you to stand up on one leg, um, stretch your hands high above your heads, close your eyes, and chant whatever God's name you want to chant. Can you do that? So just stand up on one leg. I'm sure your uh, yoga teacher would have taught you this, uh, you know, asana. So stand up on one leg, stretch your hands high above your heads, close your eyes and chant the name of God. How long do you think you can hold this pose? And can you do this without food or water for say a couple of hours? A couple of days, maybe. I'm surely, you know, not going to be able to do something like that. But did you know that the asuras uh, stood like this for tens of thousands of years and not in our air conditioned rooms, but in, 
you know, the forests in jungles with bees roaming all around, or maybe in the middle of volcanoes and underwater. Uh, you know, choose your treacherous, uh, you know, geographic condition. And there they were doing this exact pose. And they were praying to either uh, Brahma, Shiva, or Devi. Uh, so why do you think they were doing this? Okay, so I'm going to read a bit uh, about one of, uh, from the story of one of my favorite asuras, Ravana, uh, to see why he prayed like this. Yeah, of course, at that time, he was not, uh, he still hadn't gotten his name, Ravana. He was called Dashagriva. Uh, in Sanskrit, Griva means um, uh, necks. So Dashagriva means 10 necks or 10 heads, right? And that was what uh, the name uh, given to Ravana was when he was born. Okay, so here we go. The sound of Dashagriva's chants reverberated through the three worlds. 10,000 years had passed since he started his penance deep in the forests along with his brothers Kumbhakarna and Vibhishan. Surviving without a morsel of food, he cut off one of his ten heads every thousand years and offered it to the sacred fire to appease Brahma. Only one head remained on his shoulder now, and as he got ready to sacrifice it, Brahma appeared in front of him. O Dashakriva, you have performed a penance that is unmatched by any being. Ask me for any boon, and I shall grant you that. Prashad Reva was pleased. His extreme penance had borne fruit. Growing up under the tutelage of his father, sage Vishravash, he had gained all the knowledge contained in the Vedas and Upanishads, and he had mastered the craft of war. His father had also taught him to appreciate the arts and play the veena flawlessly. However, it wasn't his Brahmin lineage that appealed to Dashak Reva. His grandfather, the Daitya king Sumali had instilled in him a far greater love for strength and power, and it was to fulfill his thirst for invincibility and immortality that Dashagriva had started this penance. O oh Brahma, I wish to be immortal, Dashagriva said, his hand folded in humility. So now you know that they all wanted to be granted the boon of uh, immortality. And that's why they did all these uh, you know, treacherous penances. But did they really get uh, immortal? Did they really become uh, immortal? Uh, that is a question uh, that was obviously there uh, when you all uh, heard the story of Madhu Kaitaba also. So always uh, there is this loophole that uh, you know the gods managed to find in the bones that these demons ask for. So here on your screen, uh, you can see uh, Varaha slaying uh, Hiranyaksha, uh, Durga slaying Mahishasura, Mura being slayed by Krishna. So you can, uh, if I just had to quickly uh, talk about these loopholes uh, in the boons, um, when Hiranyaksha asked for a boon from Brahma, uh, he said that I uh, do not want to be killed by any human being, uh, none of the trinity, that means Vishnu, Shiva and Brahma, none of the, uh, of course, they, not the Devi uh, either, none of the human beings, none of the animals, insects, reptiles, birds, and he actually listed on every insect, reptile, bird, animal, you know, and he wanted to make sure that uh, there was no uh, possibility of any being, uh, you know, kind of uh, coming back and uh, killing him in future. Unfortunately for Hayagriva, the only animal that slipped out of his mind when he was creating that extensive list was the boar. And so when the time came, uh, a small boar emerged from the breath of Brahma and it uh, in immediately grew into a gigantic boar, which was even larger than our earth, uh, the size of the earth as we knew it. And that was the boar which was Varaha Avatara of Vishnu, right? And uh, Hayagriva, sorry, uh, Hiranyaksha ended up being slayed by the boar. 
Uh, similarly, uh, Mahisha Sada, it was again a very uh, egoistic kind of uh, situation for him, where uh, he again asked for a similar kind of boon. He listed down everybody who could not kill him, uh, but he did not talk about a woman. Uh, Brahma even asked him, you know, you've not listed down a woman in your list. He said, oh, if I can defeat uh, Vishnu and Shiva, then what is a woman for me, right? So he decided not to include a woman in that list. And that's how uh, Durga ended up, you know, uh, killing Mahishasura. Yeah. So again, here you will see uh, similar stories where Shanmukha is slaying uh, Taraka. Taraka had asked for a boon. A very, very specific boon of, uh, you know, he wanted to be killed by the seven year old son born to Shiva. And he had asked for this boon when Shiva was really distraught after the death of uh, Sati and he had taken a, a pledge not to marry at all. So Taraka said, Oh, he, Shiva is never going to marry. So where is he even going to get a son? And that to the son going up, you know, growing up to be a seven year old, impossible. But unfortunately for him, uh, Shiva did end up marrying Parvati. That's a fascinating story by itself, uh, how that happened. And then he was uh, slayed by Shanmukha. Similarly, Mahishi asked for a boon that uh, she could be killed only by a son born to uh, Shiva and Vishnu. Now, that was a very smart uh, kind of a boon, you know, that to ask for. But again, she was, uh, you know, flummoxed when she actually confronted Murugan, who was born uh, from the, uh, you know, uh, you say, uh, Vishnu in Mohini form, right? When Vishnu took the form of Mohini and uh, he was with Shiva and Muruga was born. So these were all uh, very interesting uh, stories where the boons went wrong for the demons and demonesses. And of uh, this is a lovely uh, Madhubani painting of, uh, you know, uh, Narayana or Vishnu slaying Madhu and Kaitaba. And I found uh, these paintings very interesting because a lot of folk art in India focuses on the stories of gods and goddesses. And uh, that's uh, something I have been collecting uh, to add to my collection of art. So here again, we already know how, uh, you know, uh, their wish went wrong. Madhu and Kaitaba's boon went wrong and they ended up being slayed. So that's uh, about, uh, you know, uh, the boons uh, going wrong. Uh, but what I want to know from all of you was, do you want to be mortal? Uh, would you do such intense penance and sacrifices if you would were to get that boon of you know living on and on and on forever, uh, what else do you think you would do uh, other than of course you know these uh, penance and sacrifices? The way Asuras, do you think you have some other ideas of uh, what you could do, and um, what would you actually do if you have to live all those years, right? If you know that you're not going to die, what is it that you would do? So these are some questions that I have for you. Maybe you could write them back to me. It will be really interesting to see your responses. Uh, and of course, I hope that you're all not still standing on one leg because um, I definitely cannot grant you any boon, right? Uh, except maybe the boon of fun and um, uh, imagination that comes with reading books. So yeah, that's all uh, I think. Uh, I hope all of you will pick up uh, Demons and Demonesses of Hindu Mythology, uh, read up all the Asuras and Rakshasas I've written in the book, and uh, maybe write back to me about what you think of all these stories. So that's all from me for now. Uh, Riddhi, uh, over to you. That was a wonderful session, ma'am. You very elaborately and correctly put how the Asuras and demons and demonesses play a equally balanced role as what we see uh, in mythology. We used to connect mythology with myths and magic and everything. But uh, having this side, looking at this side of mythology also gave a very nice and new view to viewing mythology. So with this, We'll move uh, towards the end of our session today. And I thank you so much, ma'am, for being with us today. It was a pleasure being part of this session. It will be a great pleasure to read your book as well. 
Our audience can get their copy of the book from the link provided in the description or visit a crossword store in their city. The session was supported by Rupa Publications. You can get your copy from Rupa website as well. A must read for book for all the generations today. I wish you all a very happy reading friend. I once again thank you and the audience in the form of the system. Get ready for the quiz days of this session and visit www.oclsnapco.com to participate in a quiz and win exciting gifts and prizes. A gigantic Orange City Literature Festival will be back in November 2022 in the city of Nagpur, the city of oranges. Get ready for the physical festival in the coming winter, attending awesome sessions and interacting with your favorite authors. Keep following us for the updates of the Festival of Words. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a pleasure being part of this session. Thank also, hope to see you in November in Nagpur. Definitely. Thank you.